Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette, this is Good Owl Games, and welcome to February's monthly roundup video, the one where I talk to you about the changes to my board game collection. So February may have been a short month, but that doesn't seem to have stopped the influx of board games into my house. If anything, I thought it was going to slow down, but really it's kind of sped up. There's been a lot of new and exciting kind of things appearing in my board game store um, over the past couple of weeks. So I have lots to tell you about. Um, and for those of you new here, this video is centered around, well, there's three sections. So the first is where I talk about the new games I've acquired. The second is where I talk about some of the games I've played over the past month. And then the third bit is kind of chit chat, kind of personal channels section. Um, and you can stay and listen to that if you want or don't want to. I've put timestamps throughout the entire video so you can hop around as you please. But of course, I'd love you to listen to the, the whole thing. So I suppose I should start at the beginning. So the first game on the agenda here is one that I probably wouldn't have bought if I hadn't just been desperate to buy a board game. Um, I have a tendency to go to my board game shop of a Saturday afternoon. I'll be out for a walk at the beach or something like that. And I've had a really nice lunch and there's nothing nicer, I think, than going into the store, picking up a board game and coming home and learning and playing it that night. Um, to me, that's like the ultimate Saturday. Um, and so I have a tendency to check the board game shop whenever it is we're out for new titles. And um, this one had been sitting there for some time and it's kind of on my radar I suppose um, it's the kind of game that had a bidding mechanic so I assumed it wouldn't be great at two players but would be better with more people and since I really mostly play two players it kind of got put to the side um, but of course comes the week when there was nothing else to buy and we were like I suppose maybe it's time to give Abyss a go um, and Abyss is the game with the beautiful cover it's, it's been around for some time it's kind of an older game and I think it's got a really good reputation, at least that's how I had understood it. The thing for me, I suppose, is when I heard people talk about it, or when you read the mechanics, it sounds like a game that you're going to want to play with more people. It's got kind of an auction bidding phase. It's got, you know, you're trying to gather power to your side. Um, and what it's about is, of course, that you want to be king of the abyss, of the deep, you're under the sea. And you're gathering power by getting different factions to come to your side, acquiring their lords to come and help you so that you may emerge victorious. So it sounded like a very kind of casual group game to me um, rather than anything I suppose more serious than that. But I'd like to point out that I had a great time with Abyss. It really surprised me. Um, it's very solid, it's very robust and it's very very clever. Um, I suppose the thing I should talk about is this bidding portion because it was the bit I was the most concerned about. Um, and how it works is that on your turn you can decide to get cards into your hand. You're going to need kind of faction cards and then you can use those faction cards to buy lords and they're worth victory points and they have special abilities on them so you definitely want those. Um, but to start this kind of phase where you're kind of digging through the deck of cards looking for different factions, um, on your turn you reveal the first card that comes off the top of the deck and everyone else gets a chance to buy it before you do. <laughs> which is odd, um, but also, as it turns out, kind of clever, um, because it's the same on everybody's turn. So anybody looking for cards suddenly is kind of the bottom of the pile. Um, and when people buy the cards, you get the money. They're nice little pearls, which is really cool. And all of the cards that are left over are used in a different mechanic in the game, which I think is also incredibly smart. I'm trying very hard here not to describe the entire game to you um, and <laughs> because I would be here all day if I did that. Um, but the other big feature, I suppose, is that once you get these lords into play, um, they have special abilities that'll trigger maybe straight away, maybe once per turn, things like that. Um, and if you want to have end game scoring, these are like location cards that you put into play over your lord cards, meaning they no longer use their abilities. So it's this really weird idea where you kind of, as the game progresses, you're, if you want to have end game scoring, well, then you have to give up on kind of your current bonuses. And I also think that's an incredibly intelligent design part. Um, it really does make you consider what it is you're doing and why you're doing it and, and where you're trying to get to seems to be an important question. Um, I really enjoyed my time with Abyss. It played really well at two. I was disappointed to almost say that, but not entirely. I've played it with three players as well and it worked just as well and just as quickly. And I've liked it so much I've actually put together a review about it. So keep your eyes on the channel and I'll have kind of a full exploration, deep depth dive um, onto Abyss at a later point. But um, this was a real delight and a real surprise. 
So next up is an expansion rather than a game. And this is a Feast for Odin, the Norweg Norwegians, for the Norwegians, Norwegians. Um, and oh, this is something we've been looking for for ages. So much so my husband almost bought a, a copy of it in German at one point. And I was like, no, 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 I definitely want it in English. I wanted the whole game to be in English if possible. Um, and so I suppose I should start by talking about a Feast for Odin. Um, where have you been? This is a game by Uwe Rosenberg and you might know him from other games such as Patchwork um, and loads more. But this one's particularly interesting because it is a big game, I think is the best way to put it. It's a worker placement game, you're Vikings, you're heading out doing different kind of activities. And part of the game then is also like polyonimos where you're, you're covering up different parts of your board with different shapes so that you can have kind of victory points. There is a huge number of actions to select from, <laughs> huge. And the game progresses through each round. You'll end up with more actions for more things you can do. You do have to feed your people at particular points in the game, which I'm always a bit sad about. But A Feast for Odin is a fantastic game all on its own. It's, it's, it's not actually that complicated, it's just big. So it's kind of hard when you look at it initially to decide what it is you're doing. Um, everything's put together so cleverly. Um, I love the fact that when you upgrade items, they flip over and um, they become different colors and then you can place them in different parts on your boards depending on the colors. So there's a couple of things to be watching for while you play um, and I like it a lot. Now, the expansion, this Norwegian expansion, does something very interesting, um, which is in, in the base game, there are a number of rows of actions you can choose from. Um, I think it's four. But the expansion adds a fifth row to choose from, which you can use only if you're using your last meeple or your second last meeple that you'd be placing out. And these are kind of powerful actions, and I quite like those. It also alters the board a little bit for it to be better at lower player counts, or that's so I've been told, I'm not sure. Um, I like a lot. There are also pigs in the new expansion, so you've got more animals and pigs breed faster than all the other animals. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. Um, and there are new islands and stuff to choose from that you can go and take over, um, including Cork, where I'm from. So, you know, it was only a matter of time before I owned this expansion. Um, I must say the expansion really does add a lot to the game. Like, it's an already great game, right? But this is just some extra touches and flourishes. And I think they're really pleasant. And so, yeah, I, I, I really like this expansion. I think it helps the base game a lot and I think it's fun as well. Um, so yeah, this is all thumbs up for me. I don't normally get expansions, but I think this one's definitely been well worth it. So next up is one of the most beautiful games I've seen in a very long time. And this is Dog Park. Um, so Dog Park, when you look at it, I suppose initially on the box and everything, looks like it could be a wingspan style game with dogs. Um, and I think that might have been the appeal for it. Actually, it wasn't. I just, I like dogs and why wouldn't I want to play a board game with dogs in it? Um, and when you open up the box, this is the most impressive sight to behold. Um, there are game trays inside in the shape of dog bones and they have all different um, items inside of it. The items are all little wooden tokens. So there are things like tennis balls and dog biscuits and sticks and stuff like that and squeaky toys can't forget those and what it's a game about is that you are a dog walker and you're trying to bring different types of dogs for walks um there is a bit of end game scoring um for you know the different types of dogs you might take with you or whichever dogs have leads on them and how the game works is that you bid for cards um, for different dogs to put into your kennel. And then there's a phase where you walk the dogs and you kind of walk along a track a little similar to parks where you can pick up items um, as you walk along. And then the whole thing starts again. Um, there are little bonuses as well for completing certain things each round, but um, there wasn't too many of those actually to, to be engaging with. So they almost became kind of forgettable. Um, but this game is outstanding in how it looks and how it's presented. The art on the cards is beautiful. There are loads of unique types of dogs, all of which with a little bit of information about them and their own little abilities. I do wish there was more abilities on the dogs because there are so many of them in the deck, but you end up seeing kind of a lot of the same type of abilities over and over. Um, overall, I think this game is, is gorgeous and someone put a lot of effort and thought into it, but I wish there was more game to it. What it really comes down to is that you're walking, you know, this path, picking up items so that you can buy dogs to take for a walk to pick up more items. Um, and you know what? I think that's going to be perfectly fine for a lot of people and possibly even great, but it wasn't enough game 
for me, um, which is such a shame because I don't think I'd been as excited for a game as I was when I sat down to play this because I was like, somebody really cared about this game. It looks it looks just like it. Someone put a lot of love and heart into this and I wish there had been just a tad more game. But overall, it's a beautiful game. It's a family weight game and I can, I can see families really enjoying it actually, to be fair. Um, just not my kind of jam. So that is Dog Park. So finally we get to a game I've been waiting to come into stock in my shop for ages and ages and ages and this is Lacrimosa from Devier Games and well do you like Mozart? Do you like music? Do you wish you could play as Mozart um, in a board game? Well you're not getting to do that here either. <laughs> what Lacrimosa is about is that you are a patron of Mozart and he has died leaving his final work unfinished. So you're trying to like travel around Europe and gain some fame as like Mozart's best friend um, but you're also trying to get other composers to finish um, his final work. Um, so it's an unusual setup from the beginning, right? Like you're like, wait a minute, where is the Mozart in this? Well, he's already dead. Um, now, so what is this game about, really? Um, it's a hand management game. You start with a, a hand of nine cards and they all have different actions on them. So you're going to actually tuck them in under your board um, to reveal the top part for an action and the bottom part for a bonus. So you play two cards at a time. So you leave the top part showing of one and the bottom part showing of another. And these actions are things that are out on the board that you can do. So you can travel around Europe a bit and pick up bonuses out there. You can go and try and work on this piece of music that's unfinished. You can go and get new cards for your deck, replace the old ones and get new ones. And you can also perform kind of big kind of concerts and things like that as well. Um, this was really, really fun. Um, I, I, this was much more than I was anticipating because I've been really excited about this game. So I was worried how I would feel about it. But I love this hand management part where you are kind of basically picking your actions from your hand and then you can upgrade those cards to get better actions as the game goes on. Um, I really like that. You know, Also, you know at the end of your turn exactly how many resources you will have the following turn based on what you've played. And I thought that was smart as well. So you'd be like, oh, I might need more of this or I might need that and you can you know plan ahead accordingly um that's pretty great um like it's not an overly complicated game but it was very relaxing and enjoyable to play um it takes about wasn't it like an hour and a half for us for two of us to play this um i assume it might be longer with more but the turns are pretty fast because you do these action cards and things like that Overall, I really enjoyed this one and it's a really good looking game as well. You get recess boards with spaces to tuck your cards into. It's got a lovely, big, beautiful board. You know, it's all nicely put together here and it's a pleasure to play. So yeah, I've totally enjoyed my time with this one. All right, so we're on to what I would consider the wild card. Try not to laugh too hard because I probably will. Um, so I spotted this game in my board game shop. Um, it's called Rise, by the way, in case you haven't heard of it. And I didn't really know anything about it um, other than its publisher, who is DLP Games. And I think that they have made some pretty fantastic games, um, such as Altiplano, Orleans, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of others, but they're the first that come to mind. And already I was like, oh, I'm interested. So the cover of the box looks kind of boring and uninteresting. And wait till you hear the tagline on BGG, allow me to read this to you. It says, ascend on the tracks and manage your city. And the description on the back of the box goes straight into the mechanics. It doesn't say anything about what the game is about. Um, it's kind of hilarious, actually, how dry Euro gamey the entire thing was. And in most cases, that might have put me off. But, but no, no, that's a lie. I love myself a good dry Euro. And I had a feeling that this was going to be the driest of Euros before I bought it. Um, and was I wrong? No, it's definitely the driest of Euros. So what Rise is about is that you're managing a city and you have all these different tracks. And yes, they are tracks um, that, you know, are part of different aspects of the city that you're going to want to go up. And then there are negative things that can happen to you too, things to do with the environment or people revolting. So you have to watch those tracks as well. And how it works is that, yeah, you go up, you, you go up tracks. Now, the tracks aren't straight, right? So this isn't like any other game with a bunch of tracks. The tracks are circular and each track kind of scores and behaves that little bit differently. So, for instance, there is a track that you go up and depending on how far up it you are, you can do all of the actions that you've passed on your way up 
which I thought was really cool. Especially if you get to the end, you can do all your actions in one big go and then come back. There was a track that the further you went around it, the more victory points you got, which is pretty straightforward. Um, then there were other tracks that allowed you to kind of get bonus action tokens and they're different shapes and different sizes. Um, so it's like the, 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 I don't know, the granddaddy of track games um, is definitely what we get here. And how it works is on your turn, you reveal um, a number of cards and there are two types of cards, ones which are kind of bonuses and ones which are actions. And you bid to decide how far along this kind of track of stuff you want to go so that you can get all of the bonuses, um, but you can only ever have one action. And you're chaining these actions together. So it's like, if I do this here on this track, well, that'll move me on this, which moves me on the other track, which gets me to there. And that is the crux of Rise. Um, <laughs> it's the the most boring sounding and the most boring looking game in fact it is entirely got cubes on it to be fair actually there's some nice enough art on the car and like the the tracks themselves which is grand but cubes that could have been so much better as meeple so you are literally pushing cubes around and i loved it i thought this was so much fun i had a great i had a great time with this euro game it's short enough to play it took about 40 minutes um but i love trying to figure out where i was going next on what track and taking over who with what and what actions i wanted to do next like it's very simple and elegant and entirely entirely fun it just spoke to my inner and outer euro gamer um so yeah if you want something drier than dry i couldn't recommend rise highly enough um i really had a good time with it um so yeah so that brings me to the final game on my list and this is a uh, oh this is actually just really exciting let's be honest um, and probably a little bit silly but i'm going to go with it so I'm going to start with the following and say how many of you have heard of Battlestar Galactica, the, the TV show? I assume some of you have. I assume some of you have watched it. And how many of you know of the board game um, that kind of accompanied it, I suppose is the word, or the, the board game that was brought out with it as its theme? Um, there was a time when I started playing board games and... Battlestar Galactica the board game was the game I played the most as in I started playing at the same time I was playing you know Ticket to Ride um, and everyone in my friend group pretty much had a copy <laughs> and we would play it all of the time and we ne I never owned a copy ourselves it's a game that needs minimum three players it's a big space game I'll tell you all about it in a second um, but it was something I never owned but played a lot and over the years um, it's out of print now the board game and it's not going to be made again because you would need licensing rights and such um, so the price of this game has shot up dramatically um, it's all of a sudden very expensive to own it and we were talking about it about a week or so ago and I, w I was saying to my husband you know isn't it odd that we never got a copy um, all after all this time and so my husband being the genius he is went ahead to eBay and found a copy and so it's arrived so I now own a copy of Battlestar Galactica and I'm really really excited about it because it is a fantastic game or at least it was I haven't played it in about do I want to say 10 years? Maybe 10 years. Um, so I'm hoping this isn't all nostalgia, but I'm very excited to, ha um, to have it in our collection. And what it's about is that you're all on a ship you play a particular role um, and on this ship you're facing all sorts of adversity and I mean all sorts of adversity all sorts of terrible things are happening and you're trying your best to make it back to earth but of course it's not that easy because there are aliens and they are Cylons and they're trying to prevent you from getting there and it's possible that one person on the crew with you is in fact a Cylon so it's a hidden role game and what you do on your turn is that there'll be a challenge you all have to overcome you'll have a handful of cards and you get to add cards into the pile to try and pass successfully right um and of course as the Cylon you could put in negative cards to make it so the humans don't succeed because that's usually your goal um and this is the idea of trying to keep hidden while you know messing with everything you can also reveal yourself as a Cylon too and you normally head out and leave the ship and you do annoying things from outside there but um Battlestar is a really fun group game because it's not very complicated to play it's it's fairly um I suppose obvious what's happening and it's a, a kind of a co-op game as well you're all playing together um and it, i have some of my best board game memories playing battlestar galactica um it's annoying i don't have any of the expansions i particularly would love to get the pegasus expansion because it comes with another ship um at least that's how i remember it anyway because i always loved playing as the president so there was always the other ship something like that i'm half remembering um i don't know if any of you have played it um i hope you have because it's kind of a delight to play um let me know if you have or if you played it recently does it still stand up 
up after all this time. So I'm super excited to have a copy. Now I just need to gather myself three plus players to come around and pretend to be humans or Cylons, depending um, on the case. But um, yeah, it's it, what. Well, I still think it's a wonderful game because I haven't played it since. But um, I'm looking forward to taking that for a spin, or if nothing else, kind of like a once a year game. You know, that's how I'm treating this. You know, Christmas, pull it out. You know, people around. Let's all fight over who's a toaster. That kind of stuff. So. That ends everything I've acquired this month. I actually have other things on the way, but I didn't make it in time for the, the cutoff mark for this video. So you'll have to wait till next month to hear about those. And I'm going to roll right into, I suppose, what I've been playing um, and we'll see what those were. So last month was WarpCon, which is a local con that happens here in Cork once a year. And it's the only convention I really go to. Um, and I bring a pile of board games and find people to come and sit and play with me. Um, and the thing about WarpCon that makes it, I suppose, kind of difficult is that the types of games you want to bring to a convention are different than games you would normally play. So I'm doing a bit of a, like a spotlight here on games for, I suppose, at conventions or games with large groups of people um, that may be, you know, coming or going or things like that. Um, and so I found this actually quite the challenge because I don't, I don't have a lot of kind of big group games or kind of lighter party games. Um, but this is what I brought to play with, well, anybody. Um, and the first, I think that always comes out, especially, and this works great with non-gamers as well, is my favourite Wits and Wagers. Um, now, Wits and Wagers, I have the Vegas edition. It comes with a big mat. You don't need any of that stuff. Um, but Wits and Wagers is a wonderful game simply because it is a trivia game in which you do not need to know the answers. Um, how Wits and Wagers works is that somebody will ask a question at the start of the round. So it comes, you know, questions come in the game. And the question will want you to give an answer that is a number. And it's usually an impossible question. You know what I mean? It's something you wouldn't know the number to, but you, you want to guess as close as possible because then you can bet on everybody's answers. So if you're not sure that you did a great job, you can always pick someone else's answer and bet on it as your own to make some monies. Um, and that's really what the crux of the game is about, trying to get as close to the number as you can to get to the answer as possible without going over um, and using other people's answers to bolster your own um, and make money of course and then at the end of the game whoever has the most money is the winner so with some wages it's just fun <laughs> because the questions are always so weird and impossible um, and then occasionally you'll get something you actually know the answer to which is even weirder again and then you might think yourself out of knowing the answer when you see everyone else's um, it plays up to a good number of people it doesn't take too long to play either um, and it's just kind of fun and easy going like I had a great time playing it we were in a room full of other board gamers and every time we read out a question everyone would stop and listen and you could hear them try and figure out you know what the answer might have been themselves it always involves kind of a lot of answers and chit chat and laughing um because you're all trying to figure out something kind of impossible together and or you'd be like you know you should know the answer to this um you definitely have to be the closest one to the to the answer and then it turns out they were completely wrong so yeah it's just fun light-hearted um i will always recommend wits and wagers i think that's a really really fun game so second up on the i don't know you but we should play board games together um kind of list is Las Vegas. So I'm continuing with the Vegas theme here. I don't need to, it's entirely accidental. Um, and Las Vegas is a game that shouldn't be fun, but somehow is. And I'm not the only one to have thought so. There's something about how this game is designed that makes it really, really brilliant. But also at the same time, you're just rolling dice. Um, and so what Las Vegas is about is that there are six casinos in the center of the board, each numbered one to six. You have a handful of dice. And what you want to do is you roll your dice and you put out numbers on each casino. Each casino has a value added to it. That, that's money that you will win if you have the most number of dice in that casino. Um, the f difficult part with the rolling is that you, if you roll three fours, you have to put in all three fours if you want to put a four out. Um, and so you're kind of stuck with these dilemmas of, oh, do I have to get rid of a lot of dice now or do I keep some for later? And of course, everyone else is bidding as well. So you want to make sure you have the most dice in the casinos. So it involves, yeah, di rolling your dice strategically choosing I guess which casino you're going to try and manage or if you're going to keep rolling dice or if you want to put a lot of them in to secure 
to secure a location, that kind of thing. Um, it's simple, it's fun. Um, it's also very chatty because you, there is a lot of like dice going head to head out on the board. Um, and then, and of course, there is some terrible um, cardboard money that you get. But it's fun to have it all sitting out in front of you and be like, well, how much money have you got? How much money have you got? And the winner, of course, is the person with the most money. Um, I think Las Vegas is such a fine game. I've no idea why it's half as entertaining as it is, but it is. And everyone I show it to loves it. And I wish it was more readily available. I'm very annoyed about the fact that I tell people about Las Vegas and it can be hard to find a copy. So I'm sorry about that, but I have to highlight it because I think it's worth it. Maybe somehow the word will get to like Ravensburger and they'll be like, please, you should reprint this. Someone hear me. Someone hear my prayers. Um, because it's a game that deserves a lot of love and it's, it's, it's good stuff too. So um, that was Las Vegas. And then the third game I'll discuss here um, that was also good for a group but might surprise you is um, Nidvalir. Um, never certain if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, I have looked it up before, but I'm going with, with Nidvalir because that's what we have here. Um, and this is a game about recruiting dwarves into from your tavern into your crew and you're trying to basically get the best group of dwarves that you can um, the dwarves are color coded and each color scores slightly differently so there's different types of score, scoring dwarves um, there are also coins because you have to bid for these dwarves when they're out in the inn um, bidding in this game is actually really pleasant because if, even if you don't win you get to pick something from the lineup which I always think is a bonus. Sometimes you don't even want to win. Um, and you can upgrade your coins that get bigger throughout the game and those coins are worth victory points as well as your dwarves. Um, Nidvalir is a game that has a good number of cards in it and I find a lot of my friends or people I know would be fairly familiar with card games or have played a lot of card games um, in their lives. So I always think that this translates well, that you know you recognise what they are um, and it, it was e it's easy for them to pick up. There can be a lot of cards on the table when you're trying to choose. There are bonuses you can get which can give you extra cards um, and that can be hard to choose if you're playing this for the first time. But it went down really, really well with those um, that played with it um, because it is it is pretty straightforward in the end it is just putting dwarves into play um, but it works quick and it worked well and it did good at a number of players so um, Ninfalair went down like not a lead balloon <laughs> so those are some of the games I was playing at Warpcon I've got one more game to talk about and I'm doing this out of sympathy and I suppose a little bit of regret so here we are this is my love note to Altiplano um, for those of you who've been watching um, my Would You Rather videos, you'll notice that my most recent one, um, Alto Plano, was a board game that came up. And when I went to talk about it, I didn't know a whole lot. I didn't remember most of it. And there was something about that that really aggravated me because I was like, this is very unfair. I remembered Alto Plano being a good game, even I couldn't remember what it was about. So since I've made that video, I've played Alto Plano twice. Um, and I can come back and inform you that Alta Plano is an absolutely stellar game. Um, I've forgotten how much fun it is. Um, and it is more than just, well, you know, you get goods to get more goods, which it is also that too. Um, so what Alta Plano is about is that you are farmers and you are gathering items from various parts of the board to put into kind of your storehouse for, I don't know, I'm not really sure why you put them in your storehouse. Um, but basically the game is made up of separate little islands and you travel between them and each one is a different action. Um, so there are a number of different actions you can do. You can go and get items. Um, you want to upgrade items. You can kind of get end game scoring cards. You can get cards that, you know, make your items better. Um, you can get additional tiles for you to play with. And what the game really is about is that you have items and they are all discs. And each of the locations you can go to have spaces to place these discs in to activate their um, abilities. So if you played um, Orleans, you'll be familiar with this concept of the little discs of them covering up spots and being used in various locations. Um, and that's really what's going on here. So every time you acquire something out on the board, it goes into a little cart. And every time you get new items to put out on the board, it comes from a bag. Um, so it's a bag builder. And what will happen is when your bag runs out, you get to tip everything from your cart into it, which means that 
no items are going to get stuck at the bottom of your bag so if imagine if you added new items into your bag every time there might be some that you would never see anymore because you're continually making new items um, and that's the use of the cart and I think that's what makes the game quite clever um, this one's very chill and almost I want to say kind of solitary because you are playing very much by yourself just trying to figure out where everything wants to go and a lot of it happens on your home board the outer boards are just kind of ways of interacting with your home board where you've kind of put out your items um yeah it's really fun it's really chill um i i enjoy it a lot and a lot of it is about trying to figure out well i've got the basic version of this good how do i get the slightly fancier version so that i can make the fanciest version so you know there are things like that where your alpacas go to pieces of strings and then they go to blankets so you're like how do i get to blankets i need pieces of string and an alpaca and uh, you know that kind of stuff um there and that works for for <laughs> for things like stones um and i'm trying to think of anything else um <laughs> that upgrades like that but that's the kind of idea um and the you get victory points for being able to put things in your storehouse in a rows there's victory points for those um but also your items are just worth points as well at the end of the game um yeah i i like it a lot i knew there was a reason i kept it and i was embarrassed when i had to talk about it and i couldn't remember enough i thought it was so unfair to altiplano so now i've played it twice i can comfortably say i'm very familiar with it and that i still love it a lot um it's a it's a very fine game indeed so yeah so that's altiplano my love letter <laughs> okay that's enough of me talking about what i've been playing um i'm going to jump into the personal chit chat bit section if you want to stay around that'd be great um right so let's do that so I'm hoping you've noticed that there's something different about how my videos look at the moment and that is the fact that I got a new lens right there lens um and I'm hoping it makes everything look a little less choppy um there's something um to be said for having I suppose good looking video and things like that at least I'm obsessed with kind of making it look the best that I possibly can under the circumstances and I try a lot and I learn a lot I suppose about how all how uh, cameras work lighting works all that stuff over the years um and I'm hoping that this lens has made things a little sharper a little crisper because I kept thinking the the old one was kind of blurry so you know let me know if you notice any um, difference in quality here um that would be grand and speaking about learning stuff over the years um big news here is that well good owl games has been going for five years uh as you may have remembered it once upon a time board game inquisition um is how i started it out and i can't believe it's been five years um it's kind of crazy when i think about it because this is something i started doing just kind of for fun as a way to kind of keep myself busy um during the day and have i don't know have some sort of creative outlet i guess um i'm amazed i've stuck at it for this long <laughs> and at the kind of the number of videos i've put out but it's been incredible to think about all the people i've got to meet and know all the cool games i've got to play and kind of tell you about and i consider myself very fortunate to be in this kind of position to be able to make this stuff um as i call it i suppose and for you guys to be here with me and to watch it and hopefully glean something useful from it um so i'd love to i'd love to hear from you if you have any good memories of the channel um now that it's been here yeah, it's so long so long um but yeah i'm i'm proud that it's, it's it's still here and that i'm still here so and hopefully you're still here too but isn't that amazing i think that's a i think that's a big a big deal um indeed uh right so what else has been going on um i've been doing a good bit of recording so there's going to be a number of videos coming out soon i've already mentioned the abyss review i have the clans of caledonia review ready it just needs a bit of an intro video those things take a bit of time um which is really good and i think i have another would you rather ready as well Ooh, um and what i'm working on doing right now is reviewing the board games that i've acquired that i've played three times so it looks like Lacrimosa might be next on the agenda. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you want to hear more about it. Um, does, <laughs> so I'm trying to keep everything going and keep everything busy around here. And I've been getting so many new games that I, I really want to kind of spread the word about them. Um, I really need to stop saying um it never ends does it it just keeps going so that's been the excitement there um what else has been happening <laughs> she says with another um 
on a personal note, um, going to WarpCon kind of got me in touch with um, other people I hadn't seen in a while. So I've been playing board games with new people and getting to try their games. So I got the chance to try out my father's work um, recently, which is from Renegade Games. Um, this, oh God, this is a lot going on in this one. It's one of the, it's, it's gorgeous. You think Dog Park looks good. Um, my father's work looks even better. Um, it comes with all sorts of cool bits and bobs inside it. Like you get little glass, uh, little plastic glass stoppered vials. I don't know. Um, and metal coins and all of the stuff and all of the game trays. And it's a game where you are a mad scientist and you're trying to continue kind of your work through different eras. So time changes, you know, as you as you play. It's kind of a genealogic, genealogical game like that, um, where you're passing things through each, I don't know, descendant, I think is the right word. Um, this is a game that requires an app and the app does a lot of, there's a lot of reading and story in it. Um, and the story parts as well, you get to make decisions and that affects how the boards are going to turn out. So for instance, you have your mansion um, as your crazy mad scientist and you have, you know, your kind of people to assist you, but there's also a town nearby that you affect by going to visit and making decisions about. And that town will change into various or various things or go different ways, depending on the choices you make. Um, I actually thought this game was really good up until a point for the type of game for the type of game it is. I'm not big into story games, um, but it wasn't it wasn't terrible. And the main board part where you're playing the game in between is kind of work is worker placement, where you're trying to complete experiments and things, and get goods to make experiments. Um, so I liked it to a point where where basically what happened was that someone who completed a, a quest suddenly got a negative kind of effect placed upon them for the last round of the game meaning they couldn't really play anything and I was a little surprised to see that that was a, a real thing that could happen I suppose maybe that's the nature of the game that you might just get messed over um, I'm not sure but I think it left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth but um, there's still a very good game under here and I can see a lot of people really enjoying it for me I'm just uncertain I suppose there was there's something about it that didn't sit quite right with me other than the fact it took forever to play Plus, having someone new around meant we were able to swap games. So I've sent off my copy of Nemesis and I've borrowed a copy of Seven Continent, which I know is a big game for solo players. Um, but I'm very curious to hear anyone's thoughts on it or any advice um, to give me before I delve into it in the next couple of days. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cards in that box of Seven Continent, but it looks like it's also kind of a story kind of game where you reveal things as you go. Um, and so that could be interesting too. Um, just because I don't like a particular mechanic doesn't mean I usually write something off immediately but it does make me a little bit wary but the good news is I don't own this Yay! and I don't have to so I can return it after I've given it a go which is nice um really I guess friends have uses no that's the strange thing to say isn't it but it's nice to have other friends with similar interests so you can swap and share things for sure so as usual, there are some bird photos being had and some nice outdoory shots kind of thing. Not as many as I normally would take. I've just been really tired lately, so I'm just trudging along there. But it's nice to get a couple of photographs taken for sure. And I'm still making it out to the cinema um, in an effort to leave the house at least once a week, maybe more than that if I'm lucky. Cinema is still a lot of work. But yeah, so that's everything that's been happening around here. There's been lots of games, as you can tell. Um, and well, some video stuff, which has been nice too, this new lens. And yeah, I'm trying to keep up and get stuff done for the channel. So there'll be new reviews for you guys soon. Um, so thanks as always for watching. I can't believe it's been five years. I hope there'll be another five years and maybe you'll still be here. Who knows? Um, but thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye.